I want to welcome everybody to another uh, UDL IRN Network and Learn, a uh, very special one um, for a couple reasons. A, it's always fun to do and ask me anything. And B, uh, the guest tonight is one of my absolute favorite people. Um, and so part of the UDL fam, uh, UDL rockstar. I think I, I might, must have used like 15 hashtags when uh, <laughs> describing uh, our guest tonight. So our guest tonight is <laughs> Uh, the effervescent, the always powerful, uh, Allison Posey. Uh, hey. I've got yeah, <laughs> to get some. Um, I've got to get some uh, some some sound effects so that there's some clapping. <laughs> I'm gonna throw some confetti, but I thought maybe that would be too much. Um, so <laughs> your adjectives are are amazing. <laughs> oh, are they? Okay. All right. Good. <laughs> um, and and so the way that they ask me anything for those of you that are just tuning in and this is your first time ever seeing and ask me anything. Um, the Ask Me Anything is really more a conversational piece. Usually we have a couple uh, panelists on and we're talking around a pretty, um, uh, like a pretty distinct or a pretty specific kind of topic. Uh, but one of the nice things about the Ask Me Anything is that we really get to sit down with some really great people in the UDL community and UDL world who are doing are actively doing and promoting the movement of UDL in a really great way. So <clears throat> tonight is with Allison Posey, as I had said before, and uh, one of the reasons why I, we, we wanted Allison Posey, besides all of the other fantastic things I've said, is that um, Allison has always been uh, uh, a person that's been at our UDL IRN summit. And every time she's done a talk, she has absolutely brought the house down and, <clears throat> pardon me, and uh, absolutely had standing ovations. Uh, and people want more and more and more. And so as we're gearing up for the summit, uh, we thought it would be really great if- No pressure for this year now, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not trying to set the bar too high, uh, but it's an amazing opportunity for you folks to chat with her and then come see her again at our summit, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, a little bit later on. Um, so, and as you all, uh, I'm sure are aware that uh, Allison P Posey is, is part of CAST. Um, and she has a really cool title, which we will get into in just a little bit. Um, but uh, she's been a cast for, for a long time. And when I first started in uh, on the UDL scene, um, Allison was one of the first people I met. Uh, her, Mindy, Sue, Harden from the IRN, um, and Denise DeCoste uh, from, from the IRN. So uh, those four people are the ones that kind of uh, help push my UDL journey. So it's always, it's always great when I can kind of touch back to history and, and the people that... Um, that really kind of started my journey. And I'm sure many of yours out there and many of yours in the panelists in, in the uh, attendees. Uh, so we're gonna be asking her just about anything that you want to, of uh, anything <laughs> from uh, best chili recipes to, to questions about UDL to future to just about anything. And so in order to do that, we like to send it through our Twitter um, and through our social media. So if you're, if you're out there and you're tweeting in the, in the Twitterverse, uh, hit us up at hashtag UDLIRN um, and, and post your questions there. Now, if you're an attendee and you're sitting in on the webinar, you can go ahead and ask your questions through the chat and we'll push those out as well. Uh, so, uh, so like I said before, we'll have a question and answer time after each kind of part. I'll go through that uh, in just a moment here. I'm your moderator, I'm Brian Dean. Um, and I'm on the board of directors for the IRN, and um, I am advocating uh, for a change in position title. Uh, to, I was hoping you would say those. Yep, <laughs> I'm going to uh, for either um, either or or both uh, chief shenanigans, uh, chief uh, officer of shenanigans, or chief instigator. Either one of those, uh, I'm hoping to put on my business card. Uh, we have and I will learn to spell shenanigan. Right. Right. <laughs> Uh, and then we have our two uh, media gurus with us. Uh, Sue Harden will be manning uh, both Twitter and the chat and, and Corinne Hauer will also be backing her up on that. They are um, off camera um, uh, because they rarely want to be seen in public with me, which I totally understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, so <clears throat> I'm going to introduce our guest. This is Allison Posey. Uh, this is a picture of Allison Posey. You'll see her face in just a moment. And her official title, which I love, is Curriculum and Design Specialist at CAST. Uh, you can find her at, uh, you can hit her up on Twitter at Allison A. Posey. Um, so those are there. Um, and you'll be able to see these again when, after we record them. Um, we put that, we put that up. The plan for tonight is to go through three parts, maybe four parts. Um, it's always really, 
it's my one of my favorite parts to kind of find out what the beginning of the UDL journey for our Ask Me Anything guests were. Like, where did they start? What were they doing before? Were they in education? Were they not? Um, and then we'll we'll check in for some questions from the Twitter crowd and from from our folks out there and in, in the attendees. Um, and then we're going to move into our part two, and we'll be talking about Allison's current work at CAST, what a curriculum and design specialist does, um, and also some of her fantastic stuff around engagement, emotion, and stereotype threat analysis, um, which is phenomenal and very fascinating and so much more. <laughs> then we'll come back and we'll ask some more questions. And then I like to pose a question to our folks on the Ask Me Anything of what's the, what do you see as the future of UDL? Where is that going? Um, both for the movement and uh, if you so desire, what's, what is your future look like in, in UDL? And then we'll do some final thoughts and pay some bills um, and that'll be the evening. So <laughs> without further ado, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we're gonna just jump into a conversation. So, hey Allison, how are you? Hey! <laughs> <laughs> So, um, Allison, is, uh, can I tell them about your week so far? <laughs> it's a little embarrassing. I clearly need a little frontal lobe executive function help. <laughs> right? right. Well, that was our, that was our last uh, panel, actually. Um, so we can put you into, into contact with some folks. Uh, so Allison is on her, uh, her whirlwind tour right now. Um, and she has been uh, kind enough to stop by and see us. Um, she is, uh, you, are in, you are in professional learning five days this week, right? It, yeah, and it was an unbelievable group today, really focusing on emotions in classrooms. And I don't want to go down this road of the political climate. And I, I do want to, you know, just give a shout out to the tragedies that have happened yeah. that we've heard about nationally, but there have been some locally here as well. So we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and yeah. I think there's no place better, there's no better field to be in right now than education to really try to help um, help the next generation make sense of some of what's going on. So yeah, yeah, it's been, it's been an amazing week so far, yeah. All right. <laughs> and, and I, you know, see, that's, that's why, that's why Allison, I love sitting down and chatting with you. That's just already a nugget of like really like beautiful sentiment. And you're, and you're absolutely right. Like that's one of the beautiful things about, it's one of the scary things, I think, if we're going to be honest, because uh, it's a huge responsibility, but it's also this really beautiful and unique opportunity that we have to help, um, to help shepherd, right? Where, where, our learners are going and, and how they make sense of the world and, and some of the action that they take. Um, and that's, that's been a really impressive thing to me. We were just kind of talking about it uh, before this uh, and I was talking about it with some colleagues. It's just been really amazing what students, um, what students have been saying and how they've found their own agency and their own voice. Right. Yeah. And they've done it in this really great way. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so yeah. that, so that's, that's a beautiful piece. Um, and then you're going to Sandy, uh, you're going to San Diego or you're going to San Bernardino? I'm going to San Francisco. San Francisco, <laughs> a sand somewhere. <laughs> and it's supposed to be warm, although it was in the 50s in Boston today, and I hear it's going to be about the same and rainy out there. So I'm a little, right. but I'm bringing my sunglasses. I'm going to be sitting outside. Um, right. Yeah, the first stop, actually, I'm really excited about. Um, CAST has a partnership with um, the Schwab Center out at Stanford, and they have a UDL innovation studio that they're starting up there that has been started up there and is getting uh, building momentum. And this is the first time I'm going to get to visit them. Oh, um, so so I'm going to make sure I rest up on the plane so that I'm fresh. Yeah. So excited to see the work that they're doing. And then my colleague Neil and I are going up to Santa Rosa, where we've been working with some educators from Sonoma, um, who again talk about, you know, an intense year, they had um, fire, you know, the fires. Mm -hmm. And a lot of their students, some of them lost homes, some of them, I mean, they were really disrupted this year, but they are an unbelievable group out there. Um, they've, they've seen Katie Novak, Liz Berkowitz, they've just, they, you know, they've had, then they are really committed to trying to implement some change through the lens of UDL. So they're asking mm -hmm. all the hard questions and wrestling with what we wrestle with, with, you know, how can we, 
make this more accessible? How can we build the language in you know, a less threatening way than what's on the UDL guidelines? Um, how can we really make sure it's impacting students and empowering students? I love that you use the word agency. It's a word I've been mm -hmm. thinking about a lot recently. Mm -hmm. um, so how are we giving, you know, giving students agency for their own, around their own learning? So, um, so they're out there talking the same talk and wondering, you know, wrestling with these same issues um, that we're talking about here on the East Coast. And I know, you know, we're, we're probably, um, Pamela is probably talking about in Chile. So, um, right. yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and that's always been one of the amazing things about the UDL community to me, right? Like, is that the UDL community, no matter what the gathering is, right? Whether it's, whether it's a network and learn or it's a UDL chat or it's a, a conference, uh, either the summit or the symposium, it always feels like, um, it always feels like everybody's on the same page and doing like having this kind of like autonomous collaboration, right? Where you go off and you do your own thing, but when you come together, we're all still on the same page. And it's like this very uh, summer camp kind of vibe, right? But we're all, we're all kind of doing this, but we're all kind of making our way through the movement. And, and the ownership of the movement is, is very flat in my opinion, right? Like, like um, there are luminaries and that's great, but even those luminaries you can sit down and have dinner with, right? And you can talk to, and that's, that to me is brilliant. And that brings me kind of to, to that first part. Like, Allison, where did you start out? Like, how did this, how did you get going on this UDL journey? Oh boy. Um, I mean, in some ways, both of my parents are educators and I swore I would never become an educator, <laughs> but um, I think in some ways it was in my, it was in my blood. I used to always analyze my teachers. I mean, ah, nth degree. Right. And, um, and I would get really bothered by, by some of the practice. I really, and I didn't know why, but um, I remember one student, she was a year older than I was. I was in 10th grade. She was in 11th grade. She came out, chemistry was notorious for being very inaccessible, a very hard course. And of course, I would love to go back and have a conversation about the design of the course now. Yeah. But yeah, I remember sure. coming out, she threw her backpack across the, we had an outdoor area. She threw her backpack and said, he'll never know I understand this. And that hit me so hard. I actually didn't take chemistry the next year. Yeah. I don't want to be in that kind of an environment. And then I ended up majoring in biology and needed to take <laughs> two years of chemistry and I had never even taken high school chemistry. Ended up loving um, not general chemistry, but organic chemistry. I got, got mm -hmm. super into it. So I go back and I, I just, you know, I think about some of those pivotal moments that I don't even remember the student's name. Um, and I probably, who knows what I maybe would have gotten out of that chemistry course, but something even back then didn't quite feel right to me. And I felt like taking a stand. I didn't, you know, I had right. my advisor sit down with me. We were at a very small school. My dad was the middle school head. So everyone knew my dad and, you know, Allison should take chemistry. I, I am not going to be in an environment that doesn't respect the process of learning. So I didn't have a voice as much as I do now, but, um, right. but yeah, I look back now. And, and so, so in some ways I would say the journey, um, for me started there but of course my advisor in grad school was david rose how lucky oh, yeah. is that? i mean yeah. that's just um the first i remember the first night we um we met with our advisors he had a little pizza gathering and we just went down to his office and he's just like let's chat and right away i thought huh maybe i'll take this guy's class and yeah. did he take off his shoes were his shoes already <laughs> shoes off not on that's exactly yep, right exactly his shoes were off his toes were wiggling right <laughs> That's fantastic, right? <laughs> and you know what he did is he listened to us. And I thought, here's a professor at Harvard. I was very intimidated by that. And he is sitting down with pizza. I should have known it was pizza. I hadn't made mm -hmm. that, you know, that UDL connection there. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, he honest, like he sat down, he looked at each of us, he talked with us. And yeah, and it, it, it was such a gift. I just came away going, something's right about, you know, move to Boston, I moved my young kids, and uh, uh, a lot was kind of on the line for me um, for making that choice. And it, it has paid off so much. So yeah, I, you know, in a lot of ways, I owe where I am mm -hmm. um, to, to David, as many of us do, to David Rose and, and really his, um, his comment, teaching is emotional work. And- um, yeah, Exactly, that's what I was gonna point out. Yeah, yep, he, he lived that as an educator going to his going to his lectures were truly a gift um every night i mean they just they were unbelievable um mm -hmm. and yeah so so that got me into the udl language um mm -hmm. i think i was always um 
I, I was always kind of searching for what I wanted to do. I think I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Right. I'm one of those. <laughs> one of, I got you. Um, started out as an art major in college. Okay. Um, ended up, we had to actually um, draw the cadavers that mm -hmm. were um, used in the medical um, by the medical students, and I was very nervous about that, but actually ended up loving it. Um, got super into um, anatomy, and that made me take physiology, cell biology, genetics. I got totally hooked on the content, and um, because I had that background, as you all will know, as teachers, they're like, hey, how about you teach neuroscience? Right. <laughs> Oh sure, I'll teach neuroscience, and so sure. they handed me this, you know, the college. Just jump system. in, just jump <laughs> in, right? And oh, you know, it pains me to think of what my first year students had. You know how right. that goes, where I'm just—I was a night before where they were, but um, but you know, again, that course changed my life. It really mm -hmm. gave me um, an invaluable background um, to our brain and how we learn that I didn't think about applying to my classroom until I got to grad school. You know, right. I was teaching content about the brain. I was with learners, with brains. You think that would have made the connection. Right, sure, sure. So I got to graduate school. What do you want to study? Oh, I don't know. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, so here's a couple of things that I find, I find really, in, well, first of all, having David Rose as an advisor would be pretty, I think that'd be pretty dope. Oh. Um, so and, amazing right like and and one of the things that always sticks out about something that he said was was the emotional piece right it's emotional work and it's yes. storytelling inherently right yes. um which is a beautiful sentiment right and mm -hmm. and great but if you don't see it in practice it becomes hard like what does that really mean right mm -hmm. and and so <clears throat> i think that of course, David did a really great job of that, but I, but I can see like just in this storytelling, I can already see that, that kind of that vein of passion that mm -hmm. starts, right? Like that you were talking about, right? Like, I think that it's very interesting that even, even before you knew that what UDL was, there's this, there's this spirit of UDL that exists, right? Like, and I think that, I think that that resonates with a lot of people. <clears throat> Um, because, you know, one of the biggest things that we fall, that kind of falls under fire in UDL is that this is just good teaching, right? And, and we all, we all kind of cringe at that. And we say, well, there's intentionality behind it, there's design behind it. But I wonder sometimes if the reason why we say that, or the reason why people new to UDL say that is because they've lived the spirit of UDL after some fashion, right? Mm -hmm. And now we're putting words to it. And now we're going deeper, Right. But at this at this very beginning level, we're living in this kind of spirit of what is accessibility and what does it mean to be a learner? I hear a lot of reflection in that beginning in those beginning stories that you're telling. Right. Like there's a ton of reflection. And then I love this um, this idea that, like, you know, I'm a special education teacher. Right? Like that's that's what I do. That's what I know. Um, and I you know, I worked with um, I worked with emotionally impaired students um, or students with emotional impairments. Um, and so for me, UDL was like this idea of accessibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, what I find interesting whenever somebody comes from the world that is not uh, special education and they're talking about UDL, right? Like, like how do they sum that up, right? How do they find that, right? Because I, I can put it into words of accessibility and that's, that's my dipping my toe into it because it was my job. Yeah. right but yeah. but take me through that so you're so so you're not applying it until you get into your grad work right <laughs> but but when you started to like what happened then like what were some of the first steps that you began to take yourself like saying so, reflectively yeah. so it was interesting because i started in the quote unquote gifted and talented world mm -hmm. so these students i was teaching neuroscience to um, it was through the Johns Hopkins Center for Talented Youth. So some of you oh, may know that okay. a national, international program. Now, I don't know if there are yeah. any in Chile, but I know that they've started some up in, in China. And, and it's a fabulous program, but it's the kind of program where, you know, to get in, it's a measurement on a standardized test. It's how well you do on one day on one test. So, mm -hmm. you know, that always felt a little awkward. Um, sure. so, I, mean, I didn't 
quite know why, but I have, I have better thoughts about that now. Um, but the, you know, students would, would study for seven hours a day and you had to make rules about leaving textbooks in the room and having students learn to socialize. And I started rec and I had students eat batteries. I had a student stick, um, they peeled apart a rule. It's not that I had an undisciplined class. I <laughs> it wasn't so much crazy. As oh, so, so it wasn't an assignment to eat a battery. It wasn't an assignment, it wasn't part okay. of this. All right. Okay. okay, well that wasn't on the on the approved curriculum. Okay, all right. All right. Another one, you know, peeled apart a ruler and stuck, you know, the puts put the metal end in the um, in the yeah. electric socket. You know, these are high school gifted and talented students. And I thought, well, you know, what did you think would happen? And he said, well, I thought I knew, but I just wanted to see. So, you know, there's a certain amount of um, so so a, a piece that resonated so much to me was how important the context is for demonstrating a skill. Mm -hmm. And that for me resonated in an unbelievable way because this isn't ask me anything. I'll just, I'll tell you something I really haven't opened up about before. Um, oh, but this I'm is actually, an exclusive um, folks. I'm going to lean in an exclusive <laughs> right here on the IRN. <laughs> ask me anything with Allison Posey. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll say it very quietly, <laughs> but I'm actually painfully shy. I mean, mm -hmm. painfully shy and in different contexts, I'm very comfortable. So oddly, if you put me in front of 300 people, I'm very comfortable there. But if you ask me to sit down to lunch with you afterwards, I'm going to be very uncomfortable there. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, again, I didn't have words for that, but it was something that David and UDL really helped me start to understand was how unbelievably important that context is. So I would look at my, so I kept teaching in that summer program, even um, through grad school. And I would look at these students and think, you know, in this one context, yeah, I had a student read the entire neuroscience textbook in the first week. And I thought there's no way, but actually when he would ask questions, it was clear he was wrestling with deep ideas. He had explored that content in a way that took me six years to get wow. there. Wow, yeah. Um, but then in another content, he was failing four out of his five high school courses mm -hmm. and was mm -hmm. severely depressed. So again, I was like, you know, my mind was blown with how important that context is for being able to demonstrate skills, being able to to engage with what's going on. So I think we've all, you know, and, and again, David is, is an unbelievable example that way too, that you know, he is unbelievably nervous presenting. Mm -hmm. um, and has this whole routine and ritual he does ahead of time, um, but he's a brilliant presenter. So again, yeah. like what we need to do to get into those spaces to be able to do our best learning or our best work um, absolutely requires that we bring in emotion and bring in the role mm -hmm. of that engagement network. And so once that started to happen for me, um, fireworks were going off. So many right. connections were being made because when I go back to even that story of that student I was telling you about throwing her backpack saying, you know, how mm -hmm. will I know he doesn't get that? At the root of that was emotion. Yeah. And Root of all of what I think about, you know, this the the student, you know, who was failing for it of his five. The root of that was emotion. So mm -hmm. that that central role of that for cognition has just been something that I can't let go of. And um, yeah, I'll continue to. I will, I will talk with any of you <laughs> ad nauseum about that if you <laughs> want to flag me down. <laughs> <clears throat> So, so that's, that's kind of your through line, right? Like, and it's the through line of your story, right? And that's how you tell your story passionately is through this idea of emotion, right? And so that sums up kind of our beginning piece, right? Like where, where Alison Posey started, right? And where, she, where like what I like to call the UDL epiphany happened, right? Like when the book dropped on your head and you were like, oh, I get it, right? And what I find interesting as we do these ask me anything and, and, we get to hear like from just really great thinkers <clears throat> is that there starts to become not a narrowing, but a focusing mm -hmm. of where like your, your lens through which you start to understand UDL very deeply, right? Like, like there's, there's that superficial level of like, how are we going to get, how are we going to get as many ways to onboard this as possible? Like, and, and, and superficial may be a loaded term to use, but it's, but it's a different level oh, than, than how do you start to synthesize it internally? And for you, it seems like that synthesis starts to come in when you start thinking about emotion, right? Mm -hmm. And you, then you start tying it to those, to those background pieces, right? Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't that, it wasn't that um, this girl threw her backpack. It's that she was so angry. There was such a visceral reaction, yes. right? Or with your students or with you, right? Mm -hmm. And finding that, I think finding that is, is it's an interesting piece when I, when I talk with, with folks who are deep in UDL work and people who are, are 
starting to catch the epiphany is that they have found the thing. They have found the piece that helps them synthesize it, but they're still synthesizing the whole system, right? Um, which, which I find is very interesting. So, well, so can kid, I build off yeah, of that? You can, it, it's your world, right? So I'm, I'm just, gonna, I'm just no. hanging out in your world. So you do whatever you feel. Because you know the way, you know, I plan for these in, in, in images. Yep. <laughs> and actually, so to, to kind of jump to your last question of, you know, the future where I'm going, yeah. I think it actually is really connects to what we're talking about now. So I read this great book um, called How Emotions Are Made by Lisa Feldman Barrett. I don't know how okay. many of you have read the book, um, but it's, it's fabulous. Um, and she, is, um, she talks about how emotions are constructed. And mm. so we've known, and it's always felt weird to me, even you know, as I was writing my book, as I was doing research, um, the whole idea that we have emotion centers in the brain didn't resonate with my UDL world, right? Mm -hmm. We don't sure. have learning styles in our brain. So I really had a hard time with the idea that there was like joy and fear and happiness in our brain, but right. I didn't know why. And so this book has helped give me language to, um, to better understand um, emotions and how they form and how they're constructed over time and i think oh thank you for whoever just put that link in the chat box that's I, one of our media gurus corinne howard it's awesome yeah, thank it you is. corinne yep. right. <laughs> it ties to what we're saying that you need our this stuff doesn't just exist in our brain but it's constructed from our experience so if you think of like how you learn what a dog is mm -hmm. you know at first it's a fuzzy thing with ears and it wags its tail and it's furry and it sounds like a cat. So you meet another, you know, furry tailed critter. Um, and, you know, you learn oh, this, is, you know, from language, dog, cat experience. Then, you know, a wolf comes up and you're like, whoa, okay. Right. <laughs> dog, you know, you might say dog and a parent or, you know, someone else would be like, that's not a dog. It's a wolf. And this is why we're going to stand back a little or. Right. Run. Right. <laughs> those nuances. They're not immediately in your brain. So emotions are the same way. You, you know, you fall down when you're little and uh, you feel what that is. And someone starts to label, oh, you feel sad. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, um, you know, you see someone get hurt and, 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 and you say, you know, someone says, oh, they are feeling sad. Mm -hmm. And so you start to construct this definition of what sadness is. Um, and in different cultures and in different families, it's, you know, depending on how you're raised, you're going to construct an understanding of what your physiology is doing and mm -hmm. what your brain is doing in that moment. You start to construct a label for it, you know, as mm -hmm. this is me happy, this is me surprised. And there is no universal, it turns out there is no universal emotion. And, um, and in this book, it really, it rocks your world. Like the way we've defined emotion um, and the way, the, thing, the way we've measured emotion um, actually leads us to think there is like a universal happiness when in fact their culture constructed differences um yeah it's <laughs> that was how i i had to read it a whole bunch of times right. but yeah you, so, you just blew my mind with that <laughs> so i'll pause for, for a moment but but what you're saying with um that made me think about that brian is that you're you know to approach udl mm -hmm. we have to approach it from where we are mm -hmm. if we're still at you know the understanding of dog where and it's not this and it's a little bit like this that's where we are and we're building as educators language together where we can say yes this is executive function this is expert learning but we don't totally know yet and part of the work of so many of the people who are on this so i just want to thank you all for being part of this community is to help us better define and make meaning of what we mean by expert learning what we mean yeah. by engagement and learning what we mean by executive function the udl guidelines have you know they've jettisoned us ahead in thinking about how this all comes together and makes sense but we still have a lot more to do to really concretize so part of what is so fun about udl is i never stop you know being interested in seeing you know when i visited bcsc like let's look for this stuff and let's see how it's coming to life here how are we how is bc in that community co-constructing together the mm -hmm. meaning of udl and using the language to build and deepen practice and um you know again all towards um the goal of, of empowering learners and getting back to that agency uh right. so i can't wait you know i can't wait to go out you know to california tomorrow and sure. see being constructed, see what it's looking like, um, and think of other ways that we can try to 
help folks who are brand new to UDL start to come from where they are, you know, just mm -hmm. maybe understanding dog, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, really help to deepen understanding of what, what that is, what UDL is. And it's hard. There is no one easy, <laughs> one easy way. No. Um, but it's so, it, it's so worth it. I just think for me, the, the journey has still been, um, I haven't found anything that's quite grabbed my attention in the same way. It allows me to keep learning, which, um, which I'm hooked on. So. Well, what a, what a, what a fascinating, um, what a fascinating idea that, that there's, you know, with, okay. So, so as you can tell, my mind's a little spun, right? But, but, but in a good way. So, so when I started thinking about it, right, like when we look at other, other frameworks or other initiatives that might exist in districts um, or, or in educational settings, mm -hmm. they are usually predefined for us, mm -hmm. right? And they're like this thing and here's how you move through it. And, mm -hmm. and I will be honest, like I've struggled with that myself, like thinking, well, I tell UD, people that UDL is like all these different things, but if you're just looking at the, at the, at the placemat, right? Mm -hmm. Like the guidelines and, when you're just looking at that, it looks like it's another, another well-defined or prescribed uh, kind of initiative, but- it's Three letters. Right, yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? And it has a pretty academic name, right? Like, the, like, like the, the acronym is cool, but when we say universal design for learning, that seems fairly exactly. academic, right? And then the guidelines somewhat read that way. Mm -hmm. But what, I've, what just blew my mind is that not only is there, um, not only is there contextual space around it, right? Like context of me as a teacher and how I interpret that, but there's also this huge cultural context that has to happen not, that is also, that is location-based, but also building-based. Like what's the culture of my building? What does that begin to look like, yep. right? How does that help frame this lens or this operate, you know, like however we define UDL and talk about UDL, how does it begin to define that, right? Yep. Just like this idea that there isn't a universal emotion, there is interpretation of these feelings that we prescribe to a universal emotion. Yes. Wow. I know. I know. Um, I'm telling you, it's really you guys a are lot. getting that right now. Like that's amazing, right? <laughs> uh, yes. So, and I hope to in you know in the at the IRN, I really do hope to be able to break that out a little bit more mm. and build that um, and, and tie it more to UDL. I mean, that's a lot of what, you know, I, I've been really playing with. And I love, uh, oh, Amy, you know, I mean, Amy is really talking to this, you know, that, that there are pacing guys and you have constraints of district curriculum. So you do, you have these contexts and you have yes. these set fixed things, you, you know, that are really going to be, um, they, they aren't necessarily barrier, barriers because you need a curriculum. Like we're, we're talking today, UDL doesn't exist on its own. You need intersections with UDL. Right, sure, you, can have sure. a curriculum. you can't implement UDL on nothing. So, I mean, right. Right, <laughs> I'm sure. sure you figure out a way, but it's great to have those curriculums. It's great to have, you know, those initiatives that you're really looking at. But then we really want to think about it through that lens of UDL. You know, where are those different barriers? You know, how can we reduce those? How can we really maximize the guidelines? And what do we want that vision to look like at the end. I mean, that's where do we vision UDL? I mean, is it even in a classroom? Are the classroom walls going to be broken down? Oh, sure. and, you know, sure. where, where are we talking about learning? What are we visioning? Um, and because we don't fully know that, it does make it really hard to say, oh, and then well, here will be step A for UDL. Yeah. Um, well, and, and, and I think that that's like, that's this amazing piece, right? Like, do you want to start with learning environment? Do you want to start with culturally responsive design? Do you want to start with, with instructional design? Where do you start? And then where do you start within that? And then how many layers sit on top of that? Right. And, and that's always been the struggle, right? Is like, you know, trying to define UDL, like trying to define it in your elevator speech is kind of like trying to catch water in your hands, right? <laughs> like, you know, it's there, you know, your hands are wet, but you're not sure you got anything. Right. Well, and just like we don't, if you're first learning what a dog is, you don't want to show all the dogs at once because to right, get back sure. to our pre-conversation, a Yorkie is probably not going to be in your world of thinking about a dog, you know? Yeah, yeah And so sure. part of, you know, the, the trouble, someone was just asking about UDL implementation, part of, you show the entire UDL framework and it can be like a, this is, this is the entire brain we're talking about. This is yeah. the whole 
range of human variability as defined through learning. That's wow. a whole lot. So, you know, often what we say to folks is start with the goals. Start with mm -hmm. trying to figure out where you're going right now. Right. You know, it's like the GPS. Mm -hmm. I know I got to get to California, but right now I know that my first step is to get Uber to the airport. Right. <laughs> and start sure. with my goal. Sure. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, and once, once you have that, and then you can start bringing in the three principles mm -hmm. and maybe just start asking those questions, you know, hey, how, is, how, how are you already, you know, incorporating action and expression, engagement and representation? That right there is not what we're already doing as educators. That framework is different. So, right. um, yeah, yeah, definitely um, a, lot, <laughs> a lot to take on, a lot to think about. But it's, yeah. it's, it's those I'll layers. Say are what yeah. make it so incredible. So we can have these conversations at the IRN or these other, you know, where, wherever we are, that are mm -hmm. where we are towards the goals we have with our learners, our resources, our challenges. Um, and, and, you know, and that, that is where you will never see two classrooms the same with UDM. Right. Um, right. As David Rose also said, we want our learners to become more different with time. Mm -hmm. We want our classrooms mm -hmm. to become more different with time. We don't I, I want everyone sitting and doing the same thing in the same way. Right. Wow. Uh, yeah. So I'm being selfish, and I'm uh, I'm I'm hogging the conversation with you. So I'm going to go to the folks that have been been watching us and uh, see what kind of questions are out there. Um, there are quite a few that are that are popping up, which is not a surprise, but. Um, uh, Sue has been kind of compiling, Sue and, and Corinne have been kind of compiling some of those questions. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm just going to check in with uh, you, Sue. Um, you got, you got something that you want to throw our way? Hey, Brian and Allison, you bet. We've got a couple of questions out in the Twitter sphere. Um, I'm going to start with the first one that popped up. Uh, uh, Mackenzie Nichols is wanting to hear, Allison, about your book. So ah. hear with us a little bit about that and what we can expect. Oh, that's so nice. Thank you. I'm, um, you know, it's been a little while since, um, <laughs> since I've seen it. Um, so, um, so yes, I basically explore. So those of you who know UDL well, you'll see UDL throughout it. And you'll kind of read and go, yeah, that makes sense that that's coming from Allison in UDL world. Um, and so, so I start with thinking about how we activate physiology. I mean, how is physiology basically activated um, and emotion is at the core of that? Then I definitely get into variability and get into the UDL framework just a little bit. And then I talk about how our nervous system pays attention, um, how we need um, routines, but we also need novelty. And I, I try to really give some of my favorite um, examples from the nervous system, like um, like things like we have blood vessels in front of our, our visual um, field that should occlude our vision at all times, but we don't see them. We literally ignore them because they're always the same. We don't want this for learning, right? We don't want that habituation to what's going on in our classrooms. So I try to take some of what, you know, I know about the nervous system that's really interested me in the nervous system. And, and again, like I was saying before, try to make that connection between brain research and practice that I wasn't doing for much of my teaching practice. Um, and ultimately, I try to get through not just directing attention, but I try to think then about how we build and scaffold memory and how we ultimately get to intrinsic deep level um, learning. Um, and then I actually return, I can't remember if I've shared this story with, um, with you, Brian, or not, but, um, but I actually, I burned out in teaching a number of times, as you might imagine. Uh, my, my, emotions, <laughs> my emotions got in the way, and so I start out sharing a story of this, I call it my Super Bowl meltdown, um, where I was told by um, our principal, if the Patriots win the Super Bowl, he was going to call a headmaster day and not have school the next day. This was back when they played the Giants. All the pundits said the Patriots would win and they lost. And I went upstairs and fell into tears. And I thought, are you kidding me, Allison? <laughs> Why are you in tears? I was teaching unbelievable students. I had a great staff. I, it, it was like a dream job. Why am I so upset about you know, the, 
the dream of those seven hours of break. And, and when I, you know, again, in reflection, my emotions had gotten the better of my cognition and I, I was exhausted. So I wasn't taking care of my own emotional energy as an educator. And I think a lot of times as teachers, we don't. So I return at the end of the book to really think about how we can support educators in this journey to really do our best, um, our best teaching and be in a space where we can support our own emotions, design our own environments so we can support our own emotions for the emotional work of teaching. So that's kind of the, that's an overview of it. So, so when's it coming out? <laughs> I hope July, okay. um, maybe August, but yeah, I hope to see the cover soon. Um, yeah, it was really exciting when they, um, they agreed on with a title went back and forth a whole lot of times. It's been quite a ride, um, you mm -hmm. know, to see this whole publishing process that I know a handful of you um, on the call uh, or on, on the line here know about. So, um, yeah. yeah, it is it is quite a ride. So, uh, right. so yeah, I'm definitely, you know, I'm kind of thinking I wish I could have given it to you all first for feedback. <laughs> there will be a whole lot of edits and conversation. So I'll look at it as a conversation starting piece, and then we'll co-construct a part two where we iterate design of it <laughs> right I, lo I love that so uh lots of folks asking um what's the title you got to give us a title too oh so um engage the brain design strategies that tap into the power of emotion design mm -hmm. uh, yes <laughs> i gotta get that tagline the tagline right but yeah so it's about designing to um to tap into leveraging those power the power of emotion mm-hmm and, and, and I wanted it to be called Emotion for Learning, just for the yeah, record. Okay. Uh, I the word emotion in there, but because of this constructivist way that I dive into emotion, um, they really said, I think I don't think that our, our audience is going to quite be on the same page with you with that. So I don't want to, anyway. So it is Engage the Brain. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, and, and, and who's it coming out uh, through? It's through ASCD. Okay. Which I'm very excited about because it's teachers as the yeah. audience. And yeah. I hope it's conversational. I hope it gives you, I, the strategies won't be new. I mean, you'll see these strategies, you know, just like UDL and be, I guess I do those, but hopefully the framework of thinking about them through the lens of emotion and what's happening in our nervous system, hopefully that will be the new part. Yeah. That's, that sounds like a, like, that's a, again, that's that fascinating lens work, right? That, that, um, brings home the, the same principles, right? And right. how I see those principles and interpret those principles is through yes. a different kind of lens or a different operational system. And then it's just this added layer, right? Like, so it's yes. this, this very, like we're building the diversity quilt of yes. UDL understanding. I love yes. it. So cool. love yes, it. you with your UDL brains, you all will be like, oh, yeah. I better not let UDL in there. <laughs> right, for sure. I'm, so, I'm super excited about it. Um, and I think that you have a bunch of people that are, are willing to sign up right now uh, for, <laughs> for, for, uh, for, early, uh, for early release. Well, let's do this. Let's get together someplace fun and just yeah. have, you know, a good sit down, hang out conversation about all of this. Uh, yes, for sure. <laughs> so, so sure. Brian, one last follow up from yep. Twitter on, on Allison's book. So Allison, can you give us a, a one or two quick tips about how do teachers best address um, the emotion in, in a student when it causes a barrier? And then the follow up to that is, or, or how can they help amplify uh, emotions that propel learning? Oh, it's, I mean, I, I wish I had the, a really easy answer and said, here's the little magic thing you do, <laughs> but I don't. And this is actually what I, what I shared in my, the first time I did the um, IRN summit. Um, I talked about, so the Yale Center on Emotional Intelligence um, has a tool that they call the ruler or the mood meter. They have apps about it. And it was one of the first times that my UDL intersection brain went crazy because I said, you know what, if you put together UDL with this mood meter, that's a really powerful combination for learning because, and this ties back, Brian, to our earlier conversation, the mood meter really encourages us to co-construct with learners a language about emotion. So again, in our brain, to go back to, you know, like the dog fire, you know, the dog and building up all the nuances of dog, we have emotions like I'm angry or I don't like this teacher and it's not very nuanced, right? It's one big emotion and we don't necessarily know what to do with it. We may not even have accurately identified it in ourselves. 
So the first is really just to start building a little more subtle language into the learning environment. And I know George, is, uh, George has some fabulous educators at BCSC who are integrating the mood meter and they would probably have much more concrete um, examples. But, um, but you start to build this language of understanding what is what's happening in your emotion and how is it contributing to your learning. So it's not enough. Part of why I didn't want to bring emotion into my science classroom was because I wasn't trained to deal with emotion. I know how to deal with content. I know how to teach you all about Punnett squares and genetics, but I don't know how to handle, you know, severe stress or, you know, I, I didn't want to ask because I didn't want to have to deal with it. So, so clearly there are times when emotion is so great, the classroom isn't the right place for a learner. And I absolutely want to recognize this. But, you know, in a day to day setting, we all go through emotions all the time. I remember in fourth grade, one of my best friends shot me the dirtiest look and I completely shut down. I mean, my nervous system went into full threat as though a tiger had just walked in the room, right? No cognitive learning happened there. So what I would have loved to have been able to do would be to take something like the mood meter to be able to recognize, whoa, you know, my emotion just went into this state. And then said, but you know what? My goal for right now is, you know, to do something cognitive. I can't, it was a language arts class when it happened. I have no idea. Maybe it was some noun verb agreement or something we had to do. What do I need to do? What strategies are available to me right now in this context for me to be able to still achieve the learning goal? And it could be that I need to go in the corner and put some headphones on and do my noun verb agreement work on my own in the corner. It could be that there's, you know, a collaborative space in the room. And right now, the best thing for me to do is collaborate with some other friends who aren't, you know, that one who shot me the dirty look or, look or whatever. But when we have some flexible options in the design of the learning environment from the beginning, informed by UDL often, um, then we have those options available. So when that emotion does start to overrule our cognition when we feel it start to interfere we can identify it we don't have to be nervous about it we don't have to lash out we don't have to necessarily even leave the room but we can all still right. learn how to manage those emotions within that context okay right. thank you all for sharing that yeah they're doing wonderful work with the with the mood meter yeah it, it, and it, in in my county in michigan it is um it's a big push to the work that we're doing right now that and you know um <clears throat> restorative practice and, and mindfulness and all those pieces. And all of those pieces are really, like it's, it's just so interesting to me that UDL still is, is so topical and relevant within all of those, all of those kind, of, kind of conversations, right? It's just, it's amazing to me. Um, I'm gonna go to the chat though. I'm gonna ask Corinne, did you have some uh, questions that you wanted to, to shoot at uh, Allison here? Um, yeah, Brian, there was a question earlier. Let me scroll up really quickly so I can see someone. Um, Lisa, I believe, was asking about, um, Elson, if you had recommendations, speaking of meeting people where they are um, and in their, in their current context, she's talking about um, having done some overall general awareness of UDL, just kind of that big, broad picture. Mm -hmm. um, what UDL is, why it, you know, what's important about it. What are the next steps you see mm -hmm. for helping like people really engage and dig into the work after that? What would be your recommendations? Yeah, there are a lot of different ideas, many of which come from some of the fabulous people on this, um, on this um, session with us. But one of the things that we found is really important is to take a team of interested folks and start visiting each other's classrooms get into, you know, de designing, learn, you know, lessons together. Um, I recommend it being, you know, a lot of districts are, you know, teachers are voluntold. What did, I don't know who originally came up with that word voluntold, but it's brilliant. That's what, you know, often happens. Um, but make sure it's folks who are really interested. And maybe they saw your introduction to UDL and they said, this is something I'd like to do. Give some time for them to meet um, so that they're not trying to, you know, do it during their lunch, that it can actually be, you know, within the, the design of the, of the day. And really, um, you know, dive into, like, you could do a book discussion 
Design Group. You could, you know, read Louis's book and, and get some ideas from Design and Deliver. Um, there are some amazing um, UDL books that are out now, um, not just from Cast Publishing and Brooks, but, you know, a lot, a lot of different places, a lot of great books. There's, you know, Elizabeth Stein did a, a beautiful one on co-teaching. Um, so, you know, maybe find one um, from where you are, you know, Liz Berkwitz on, on higher education and implementation. Um, so, yeah, find one that, that maybe seems to resonate, have book discussions, go into classrooms, talk about goals, really talk about goals. I can't emphasize that enough. I know goals aren't shown on the UDL guidelines, but if you don't have a goal, you don't know how to apply UDL. And that is the one thing that I find I end up saying over and over again when I'm, when I'm out with educators. Usually, their questions can be answered when we ask, what's the goal? And when you identify the goal, and it's clear for the amount of time that you have, then you're able to think about how to be flexible. So those options aren't just about options, but it's about purposeful, proactive options. It's about thinking deeply about engagement. It's about thinking deeply about the other, you know, Brian, as you were mentioning, some of the other intersections that you have and how they are, are like social emotional competencies give great goals and UDL is a means for how to achieve them. So often we have these great what's, but we don't have the how. And UDL provides that how with a consistent language, a consistent way that we can go in. Katie Novak showed this um, really interesting video a few weeks ago where it was just a teacher in practice and she asked educators, you know, how do you think this teacher is? How would you evaluate them? And we don't tend to have a common language for us to even have a conversation about, is this even good teaching? Is it effective? If so, why? What is your evidence? And UDL really you know, does, a, does a lovely job, I think, um, of trying to unify that language. It's not perfect, and that's why it will continue to evolve and change from the work that we're doing in the field from educators like you who say, actually, you know, this needs to go in here, or this is where the barriers are so that we can keep recrafting the guidelines. So no more will be coming out. <laughs> I hope that helped. I mean, that's obviously, you know, a huge question that we could spend a long time talking about, but, um, sure. but that can give you a start, hopefully. Yeah, that's a, that's a whole series, right? Like that's a, that's a whole series. Corinne, do you got anything else? I, I do actually building off that. Allison, one of the strategies that you'd mentioned about um, you can go a, a variety of directions. One thing you mentioned, even like a book study, even just starting small, something that's really comfortable. If people aren't comfortable sharing each other's practice yet, that's something really safe like that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, one of our other uh, UDL gurus and field leaders, Louie, she posed a question. So there are so many great books on learning and emotion. Mm -hmm. So what are the good ones? Which ones are really grounded in quality science besides yours that will be coming out soon? <laughs> I cannot recommend Emotions for Learning enough. I really can't. It's big, it's dense, so it's not a, it's not a light read, but it is, um, it's seminal. It really is. She is a top not re not notch researcher. She has been in this field for a long time, and um, and I I just I really highly highly recommend that one. Um, <laughs> this is not going to be one that you're expecting, but I didn't you know didn't brainstorm this question ahead of time. So David Rose, speaking of David Rose, we actually live in the same town, and he recently asked me to do a talk at a little local place here in town um, over Valentine's Day as to whether or not love is an extreme form of engagement. So he knew, you know, that we spend a lot of time thinking about engagement and is it on a continuum with love? So I had a great time exploring that question and um, coming up with a very short, I had 10 minutes, so you all know what that's like, where you're like, wow, okay, I gotta really narrow in. Um, and I had so much um, very, you know, just fabulous work I wanted to put in there. So Helen Fisher has written a book called The Anatomy of Love. She is one of the world's renowned experts. She now works for Match.com, um, but she is trained as a neuroscientist and she has studied the neuroscience of love. So that has been a really interesting topic <laughs> to dive into. Um, and my other favorite author to check out is a woman who was a seventh grade English language arts teacher, and she turned affective neuroscientist. Uh, her name is Mary Helen Imordino Yang. Um, in another life, I will have the energy to do what she has done, you know, with kids and the PhD and all, you know, that went into that. But um, but she follow her work. She is 
grounded in education because in her heart, she was first an educator. Um, but she, you know, likewise got hooked on the whole way that the brain um, and especially emotions can really impact cognition. And she, her work is largely on the role of empathy and, um, and social um, and emotional connections, not, not social emotional competen competencies the way it's used by Castle's work, but she really thinks about it deeply in terms of um, how we're constructing um, citizens for our society. Um, you know, deeper meaning beyond even the classroom. So check out the word. Uh, yes, yeah, so she is there at the Ross at the Rossier School. That's correct. Um, so thank you all for getting those links in there. Um, so she's come up with a, with a book that I'm not. It's it's something like emotion and the brain. Also, is something like that. But by Mary Helen and Mordino Yang. So I would say those are a few fun ones um, to start out with. <laughs> There's also a great TED talk by this awesome guy called, um, he wrote this book, um, Robert Sapolsky. There's his name. Robert Sapolsky wrote a great book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And he has written another book um, that's very different from Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, but it's called Behave. And his TED talk on Behave is again, mind blowing. He takes this moment of, does someone pull a trigger or not? And he looks at an instant before, a minute before, what's happening in their brain, in their body, an hour before, a week before, a year before, in evolutionary time, what has gone into crafting the genes that are impacting that body that's in that context, in that moment. It's a really deep way of thinking about how your biology is interacting with the environment. Um, so he's wonderful too. His TED talk is much more accessible in some ways than the book. Again, that's a book that I'm like, <laughs> it's gonna take me six years to get through. It's awesome, but like the neuroscience textbook, it takes some really, um, clear focus, but he's a brilliant speaker. Um, so yeah, I'd recommend a couple of those. And I'd love to hear your book recommendations. So if you have a fabulous book you've been reading, um, I would love to hear what those are. Uh, well, so that, that was a great list of resources. So uh, thanks to Corinne and, and uh, everybody for um, putting those in the chat as quickly as they did. Here's the, here's the wild thing, Allison. We are um, winding down our time. We got about four minutes left. It's, it's amazing how quickly it's gone. Um, so so uh, I want to come back to two questions I have for you, but I, I, but I got to pay some bills first, right? So we oh, got to yes. pay some bills, hey, right? Yes. So, uh, so I'm just going <laughs> to jump into those. And then uh, I've got two questions uh, that, that I think will finish things out for us. I'm sorry. Let me uh, share my screen one more time. Uh, I minimized my window, so now, of course, everything's uh, taking me a little bit longer. Good. So. While you're doing that, folks can enter their favorite reads that they're they're checking out these days. Right. right. <laughs> you can't wait. <laughs> all right. So, uh, as you all know, or you should know, folks, the uh, UDL IRN International Summit 2018 Woo! is coming up. Pre conferences April 20. Pre conferences are on April 25th. The summit itself. Uh, is April 26th and April 27th. Uh, if you want to go and check and register, and why wouldn't you want to do those things, uh, just go ahead and go down to summit.udl-irn.org. Um, we are on track to have a pretty uh, amazing time. Um, here's just some of the things that, that we are very excited about pushing and, and having happen. Um, we're going to have six, we're expected to have 600 plus attendees. Uh, and so we're looking, we try to build a, a really great network into our system. Uh, so we'll have our UDL Crusader game. We'll have uh, design labs so that you can work, uh, work through, uh, um, work through different uh, ideas. Um, we'll have UDL products. We're going to have our first uh, interactive village. Uh, we're going to have the UDL block party, y'all. The UDL block party is going to be out of this world is going to be lit so you want to make sure that you're there for that um we are going to have just tons of great people speaking allison will be there uh joni dango will be there like if, if you're looking for a who's who of udl they're going to be at this at this uh summit so again in order to go to register please summit.udl-irn.org book now um be, because you're going to want to be there the other thing i want to push is that cast 
fourth annual uh, UDL symposium, Empowering Learners, is, is uh, looking for proposals still. Those proposals are due Thursday, March 1st by 11.59 p.m., which means that I will be submitting mine at 11.57, just in case there's something that goes wrong. I was gonna say, I promise no one will be up at that time right? checking. <laughs> right, okay, well that's good to know. That's good to know, because I might stretch it all the way to midnight. Yes. Uh, but the actual symposium is Monday, July 30th through Wednesday, August 1st, 2018, uh, and it's at the Harvard Law School. You are, if you, if you can make it to two things this summer, right? The summit is one of them, and then the symposium is the other one. Absolutely, you want to make it to both of those if you can. If you can't, pick your poison because they're both really, really wonderful places to go. Um, and, and really great learning and networking uh, to happen as well. Oops, I got to present one more time. I'm sorry, I got one more bill to pay. Folks, I can't tell you enough, UDL chat is one of the things that is very, very close to my heart. Many of you folks that are here as attendees today on the webinar and those folks that are watching us uh, and, and following us along out in the Twitter sphere and everywhere else, UDL chat is, is to me one of the first places I stopped and, and really got to know the UDL community. That chat, hashtag UDL chat, happens every first and third Wednesday of the month. Make sure that you tune in. There are a bunch of moderators like uh, Kim Coy, Mindy Johnson, um, Joni Denger, uh, Ron Rogers, Elizabeth Stein, uh, just the list goes on and on. Um, and we're always, they're always talking about really great stuff. So make sure that you're tuning into UDL chat in the Twitter sphere every first and third Wednesday of the month. That's eight or that's 9 PM Eastern time. And it's a half hour chat. Allison, you want to push anything else? Oh, those sound amazing. That's going to keep me more than busy. <laughs> right? right. Well, that's the, that's the great thing. So there's BCS UDL chat that, that is out there now. And there's, exactly. there's just so many of these different pieces that are popping up. Um, there was one that I just saw the other day. It was an Aussie Ed piece as well that was, um, um, <clears throat> that was around UDL. So it just keeps popping up everywhere. Uh, AT chats out there. There's so many great resources mm -hmm. to tap into the UDL community. Um, so I got two more questions for you. I'm going to ask the first one. It's the easiest one. If you, I have to ask everybody a different question. If you were to be a UDL candy bar, what would be the things <laughs> in your UDL candy bar? Well, if I were a UDL candy bar, I would have a different goal. Depending on the goal, I would have a different choice of what I could choose. Um, so sometimes I might want something fizzy, sometimes I might want something sweet, sometimes I want the sweet and the salt. So I would want to be able to choose my goal for that moment and be able to have a couple options. And for me, there would always be dark chocolate in it. I mean, that's, uh, that is a, like a, a daily addiction right? <laughs> that I would right. have to have. Like if a salad bar were to be, were to be turned into a candy bar. There it is. There it would be. <laughs> yes. And you get it in a little wrapper and nice. you, have, you can open it up and see what you're going to choose today. <laughs> nice. And then my last question is, ends on a, ser a little more serious note, but if you were to pick out two or three things that you think are going to be the growing trends of UDL or UDL in the future, what would those be? Oh, I know. Yeah, it's, it is tough because we need to go back to remember if we can't get access we can't get to higher learning. So we can't forget that core of access. That's so super important. And as we push to really think deeper about how we define expert learning, um, I think if we, as long as we're keeping those two bookends ever expanding, the yeah. way that we're giving access and the way we're building for all learners, that expert learning. I would say, let's you know, keep an eye on those. And, and obviously I hope, you know, I, I foresee engagement being in the middle of all of that. But yeah, I think yeah. let's keep pushing those edges. Let's innovate from those edges. That's fantastic. It's fantastic because there's, so there's so many different angles that that can take. Yeah. Um, so, so with that, I unfortunately have to bring our conversation to a close uh, on, on this uh, Network and Learn. But I have to tell you, Allison, this has been just a fantastic time for me both on a personal level and a professional level, you've blown my mind like you usually do. <laughs> Folks, if you, if you can give a digital hand clap, Allison Posey, <laughs> one, of, one of the greats of the UDL community, uh, super accessible, um, uh, even, though, even though she shared with us that, that um, she's, she's a bit of an introvert, she's, a, she's an outgoing <laughs> introvert, right? But catch you talking about topics of emotion, 
uh, and and engagement. And I'm sure you're gonna end up you, you're gonna end up sitting down having a great chat. <laughs> I'll break out of that that little shy zone. <laughs> Brian, so, thank you so much for having oh, me. And no. I just I want to thank you all for joining this late at night to have this team here. Really means a lot to me. So thank you all for coming out. And I really look forward to chatting more with each of you wherever we end up meeting up. Fantastic. Again, thank you so much, Alice. And we could probably spend another half hour thanking each other. I do. But I'm going to say it again. <laughs> thanks so much, Alice. And thanks to everybody out there. Louis, don't think I didn't see you creeping out there. If you haven't picked up Louis Lord Nelson's books, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing with your library, y'all? Don't go to sleep on that. That's something that you need to definitely go check out. Allison's book is coming out. Paved Sorry, the way. Louis's book paved the way. Right? Yeah. Allison's book's coming out in August. Look for it. It's uh, going to be phenomenal. You can catch this recording and share this recording with others. Uh, we're going to put it up uh, by tomorrow. We're hoping that we're going to have it up on the udlirn.org site. So come and check it out there and check out all of the other great panels that we have going for the Network and Learn. With that, folks, have a great evening. Um, I'll sign off as I sign off on UDL chat, right? Peace, love, and belly rubs. I'll see you all later. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good night.